To explain biology, scientists like to show colorful schemes, like this one. Sometimes these diagrams are really beautiful artworks and, if well done, explain to the human contemplator how things work. But is it just about using art for making science comprehensive or can we do something more rational, even mathematical, with these diagrams? That's what we are going to address in this lecture. Many of you have already seen these colorful overview schemes depicting networks of interactions between molecular objects inside a cell. As for now, it doesn't matter what these objects are. Here they are proteins. And it doesn't matter what kind of interactions we are talking about. In this scheme, it is a variety of interactions. Both can be completely different kind in this example. The point is, such an artwork is designed to explain a certain complex mechanism. All we see here is what we call a biological network. Of course, this is just a tiny part of all processes that go on in a living cell. Such a representation is a didactically reduced and abstracted schema, even with different abstraction levels in different parts. As in a real masterpiece of art, like this one, Brightness and colors are chosen to direct the attention of the contemplator to those parts of the picture the creator deems most essential. But in this lecture, it is not art that we want to speak about. We want to address a scientific problem since the objects in our picture are objects of a scientific investigation. And actually, not the individual objects, it is the entirety of their interconnections we want to understand. That's what modern biology is about much more about interactions than about objects. You may call it an approach to a holistic view of the living world. But before drift off to philosophical considerations, let's step back to science. It is a scientific task to transform what we have seen in the artwork before into something formal and exact. That is, if ever possible, to find a mathematical way to describe a biological network. Such a formalism exists, and it is called graph theory. What is a graph in mathematics? What actually is a graph in mathematics? The verbal definition is that a graph is a set of vertices and edges. It looks like that. This indeed is a graph. You may say, where is the math? It's just again another piece of artwork. I know that sometimes biologists get panicked when they see a mathematical formula. Not to shock you too much, I'll give you a little warning in the future when mathematics show up. Like that. Before I show you some math, I will tell you, I'll give you this kind of warning. Ready? This is the definition of a graph. So once again, a graph is a set of nodes or vertices V and edges E. For today, this is the only equation I'm going to show you. For this, let's have another look at our graph. To identify the individual nodes, we add labels. We call this an undirected graph because the edges don't have a direction. The so connection from one node to another, say from A to B, is the same as vice versa, from B to A. This type of graph is the right choice when you want to model a network of physical interactions between molecules, for instance proteins. One example for such a protein-protein interaction or PPI network is the interaction network of the tumor suppressor P53. From this example, it's clear why an undirected graph is the right model. When P53 binds to MDM2, then MDM2 also binds to P53. Another example is the giant network of all protein-protein interactions of a yeast cell, whatever all means. Something like this may never be really complete, but is gigantic, as you can see. 
Whether you can infer or learn anything from such a huge hairball diagram is another question, but sometimes you may visually recognize some structures in such a network. You have certainly noticed that up to now we spoke about undirected graphs. From that you may assume that there are also directed graphs and right you are. Let's go back to our graph that we have labeled. And you see that we simply turn the lines between the nodes into arrows. We say that the edges are now directed and directed edges are also called arcs. As a consequence, the connection between two nodes is not symmetric anymore. You can go from A to B, but not from B to A. Or when we turn it into something more physical, A exerts some effect on B, but B does not on A. I hear already your next question, but what if B also acts on A? Good question. Has to be, since I have put it myself. In that case, you have to introduce a second arc from the reverse for the reverse direction. For you, as a biologist, the use of such a directed graph for modeling biological networks may already be obvious. When you are dealing with regulatory effects, this type of graph is the model of choice. Let's have yet another look at the diagram that I have shown you in the beginning. It's a typical picture of a signaling network comprising several signal transduction cascades. The direction of the signal is a one-way road. It goes from the ligand outside the cell and its receptor in the cell membrane down to the transcription factors in the nucleus. Principally, each reaction is reversible. We do not consider here the interesting thermodynamic aspects of such a signal flow, but as a result this cascade has a clear direction. The signal will never flow back from the nucleus to the receptor at least not through the same series of reactions. So we learned that there are graphs that may differ in style of their edges, undirected or directed. But they all consist of nodes that are all of the same type, principally. But you may also construct a graph that has two different classes of nodes, like this one. Here an additional rule applies. Only nodes of different classes can be connected. In a bipartite graph, this results in an ever-alternating order of connections. But you can have even more classes when you have a tri- or multipartite graph. Still the rule applies, connect whatever you like, but never nodes of the same class. What would be a good application for this type of graph? Have a look at one of these typical diagrams of the very famous database Kang. It is best known for his representation of metabolic pathways, here a part out of the glycolytic pathway. You see here the substances that are converted into each other as small circles, like beta-D-glucose on the left side or beta-D-glucose 6-phosphate to the right side of it. They are connected by an arrow or arc that indicates the reaction converting the one into the other. Overlaying this arrow is a rectangle with a four-digit numerical code. This code indicates the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. For instance, 2.7.1.1 stands for hexokinase, 2712 for glucokinase, 27163 for polyphosphate glucose phosphotransferase. Thus, we can represent this reaction of the glycolytic pathway in the form of a bipartite directed graph like this. With this we finish our first lesson on modeling biological networks. Now you can choose how to continue. The next lesson will be a more biological one dealing with the different kinds of biological networks and how they principally differ. If you prefer to go ahead with the graph theoretical considerations you may skip that lesson and go straight to the one that follows where we will learn more about graphs and their properties. See you next time.